Okay, good morning. Good morning. So, yeah. Turn phone sounds off, especially if they have a catchy beat. <laughs> so, this is broken, and it just had a little note that says, yeah, we IT, we know it's broken. And uh, basically, I'm aware that the video went up, and there was, for some reason, it caught the edge. Uh, I don't know what that is. You, for some reason, you had some issues seeing the words, but uh, I just made sure that I'll catch the whole thing this time, so it should go up fine. Uh, so basically, I'm going to try to have this here and go back and forth and try to bring the laptop here and so that way you can all see it and I'll have the epic pen. And I highly, highly recommend later some point this weekend watching the whole thing since <laughs> we're going to have a hard time seeing it. And then I'm going to go over to Anderson and say, yeah, this, this, this room is not happening. Because no, if they can't, if it's the semester and they can't guarantee, I mean, the one thing I say is I, I need a screen to be able to present my lectures. And if they can't guarantee that, then this, is, this room's not happening. And it's obnoxious and it's clear across campus. And, so, OK, so the last thing we covered last lecture were the two example questions. So we had and so the general idea is we have our pull up and pull down network. So this is the supply voltage. And these are PMOS transistor up here. That's the pull up network. The pull down network is the MOS transistor. Where your MOS transistor is like a bar on and this is our bar right? So we basically want electrons and poles to blow. And so the general idea is of this NAND gate is that it's going to be the reverse left, so it's going to be 1, 1, 1, 0. So you want to flow from the, I guess I can just set this up here. So you want the flow, if you want it to be a 1, to come from VDD to the output. And if you want it to be a 0, you want it to come from ground to the output, which means you're So that we know that PMOS transistors are in series when you do OR. Now, why is that? I'm sorry, we should specifically say NOR. Why would they be in series? Think about the, the, the example 1.2 we did last class. First of all, what's the first step of any of these problems? I know it's 9 o'clock in the morning, it's so hard. What was the first step when you did all these? I told you you didn't have to write out everything, but there was two things you had to write out. Truth table. Truth table. There you go. So what is the truth table of a NOR? So I got 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And what's the resulting truth table? That's NOR. 1, 0, 0, 0, correct. And, the reason, and so here's what happens. We need to see what values we want when we want a one on the output to answer this question, why are they in, in series as opposed to parallel? So what's happening is, remember that PMOSs are a strong conductor of zeros on the gate, but they pass one through the channel. So what's happening is, I want to put zeros on these gates and the one flow to the output. So in NAND, I want 
either of them to go through because it's going to be 1, 1, 1, 0 because I want any instance where there's a 0 to produce a 1 on the output. But in the case of a nor, I only want it to be when both of them are. So therefore, instead of them being in parallel to have either of them, they should be in series so that way both of them meet that requirement. So when we did 1.2 down here, design nor gate, That, means that, that, was a NAND, that was an AND gate, so we just did a NAND gate and inversion. So we do a NOR gate, and that's why they are, in fact, in series. So now that we, now you know that, if I ask you, in the instance of a NOR, why are the NMOS transistors in parallel? Anybody want to tackle that? Because you'll definitely be answering a question like that in the future on an exam type question. So somebody's like... Well, walk through that same logic that I went through with the PMOS and the POLA, because it's just basically the opposite. I want it to be either of them to be a one. Yeah. So, and where specifically is that one going? This is why you don't just mindlessly copy the CGO to actually remember, understand what they mean. So when the one on the input comes into the transistor, what part of the transistor is that actually going to? The gate, right? Come on in. Yeah, we're making do with a bad IT system, but I'll email everybody uh, where the next, where the new classroom is. So let the lady through. Don't you all, gentlemen? <laughs> Okay, so, so we've accomplished step one. We know that the ones are going to go on the gate of the NMOS transistor. So what is, what, but by putting a one on the gate of the NMOS transistor, what does that mean? What are we actually doing? Think, think about, yeah, so opening the channel, because when you put a one in, what, so there's, what are the four parts of the transistor that we went over yesterday? Source, frame, Source, gate, and this is the bulk, right? So you have the bulk of the transistor, and you put a one on the gate. The bulk is what was is what type? Go, go for P, P, right? Yeah, P type. Because you want to push it away so you can create that channel for the N type gate and drain, the source and drain. Sorry. So what's actually happening is that's this is why understanding if you understand this physically what's going on at the inverter NAND gate and NOR gate level you'll basically be able to design any CMOS circuit. So what you're doing is you're putting in a one. So when you have the case of the NOR it's one zero 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 right. So anytime I have a one on one of the inputs I want to be able to create a channel for flow from logic zero at ground to flow to the output. So basically, you're gonna CMOS when you when you realize and you're really when you realize you're really understanding it is when you're thinking of it as gates and when you start doing it at the synthesis level, you're thinking there's just complicated Legos. And that's when you're like, oh, I'm just putting all these all together. When you're starting to see that happen, that's when you know you're actually understanding it. So now you're creating gates. So in this case, I only really want VDD to flow to the output when both PMOSs gates are open so that way they can flow out. Otherwise, if one of them is shut, then it shouldn't work. And that's what we want. But here, I want either of them. So that's why when we say the NOR are in parallel, that means either of them can work. And when the PMOS are in series for the case of NOR, that means I want both of them to work. So series means both. It's just like resistors, right? You put, it, you put, this, then you put the resistors in series, they add up. You put the resistors in parallel, you have to use the one over equation. So that's the same case here. So I want to show you guys this video. I'm going to try to make it uh, the whole control click. Let me turn up the volume here too.
Since the corn is a good analogy. But I'll stand up so everybody can see it. Is that better? Looks like the same graphics from Jurassic Park in 1993, right? Yeah. Remember from last class who invented that? Same guy did the JK flip flop, Jack Kilby. Can you see how the transistor is starting to form?
Alright. So all of these different uh, portions of the foundry, that's what they were showing is not, that's known as a foundry. Are you, how many of you are familiar with what a foundry is? The general idea is a, a computer chip foundry is where they make computer chips. And all of those different stages, whether you're being in the white room overview, doing overlooking the lithography process, where you're putting all the lacquer on there and doing all the uh, uh, ox, you know, put, putting in all the atoms or testing in fault tolerance or make or logic verification, all these different stages, all there require people to, who are competent and understand all the CMOS to be able to do it. And as George and I can, as George can tell you from when we were looking over potential jobs, all of those people are pretty well compensated for their work. Actually, it's fair to say they're, you, you'll be within five years of hiring, you'll be making triple figures, you know, in these kinds of, this kind of work. So, um, it's actually, it's really good to be able to understand how to do this because people will then want you to do it and you can live a happier life or whatever. Um, so basically, I'll send this VNA to you and I'll put this up for the uh, extra credit. So com when, compare the fabrication method shown in this uh, video with the animation of the 22 nanometer layout process. So the 22 nanometer is different because you have to worry a lot about a lot of different physical aspects. As, as you can imagine, you've got 0.18 micron, which is you know, uh, 0.18 times 10 to the negative 6. <clears throat> you have certain distances you have to worry about, but then you get to 22 nanometers, which is 0 0.022 times 10 to the negative 6. Now you're working 22 times 10 to the negative 9. They get much closer and closer. So you're trying to create these voltages with these much, much smaller sizes. Can I help you guys? Okay, so, and then you have to worry about all these different uh, issues. So, uh, it should be, okay, so example 1.4, I have not D plus or A, A or B. So I'm going to put this up, try to put this up on the board. Hopefully we have markers. I should just figure that we might not. And we don't have that. So here's the general idea. We want to take these rules and see how we can actually make a network, like a uh, list here. So the whole idea, if we have D or A and B or C, you want to start breaking these rules down and seeing which ones are going to be in parallel and then which ones are going to be in series. So we start with the pull down network loop that I have drawn here. So the general idea is that B or C starts first. So we've, in the problem, it's negated. So if it's negated, you don't have to worry about that extra step because it's always going to work. So if B or C, what's the what, how how's the rule work for n mods? Are they in series or parallel when they're four? N mods, they're in parallel, right? And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put B and C in parallel, and then it's they're anded with A. So what are we going to do with that? In series. So yeah, so we're going to put it like this. We're going to put them in series with an and, right? And then we have D or A and B or C. So what are we going to do with this D? Parallel, right? So we go up here to the top, and then we do our, uh, so this is going to be D, this is going to be B, this will be C, and this will be A. And this also goes to ground. So that's how that works. So then, in this case, how does the pull-up network work? Then? So we have B or C. So how, do they, how does that work in the PMOS? If they're in parallel, they're in series, correct. So then it's going to look like this. You're going to have B and then C in series. Right, and so now it's and now that is ended with a. So what are we going to do with that? Parallel. parallel. So that's going to be in parallel here. So this is going to be a. Right. So now we have our parallel. So then it's ORed with D. So what are we going to do? 
it's going to be in series. And so this becomes our PMOS. That's D, A, B, C. And then it's going to be our output. And then we have our... Um, yes, may I help you? No, they just left a note that said we know it's broken. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. B, C, and then these over here. So here you go. That is our circuit. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've almost gone from SSI to MSI right here. So you see how this how this little algorithm that I came up with helps out? It makes it a lot easier to design design this. So let's say we have an instance where we have zero, 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 and one. So we're gonna have a one or zero, zero or zero, right? So zero, 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 that's gonna be zero or one. If we don't go one, that's negated. So we're expecting the zero on this output, right? So let me change the color here and describe what's going on. So we have an A is zero, correct? So A is zero, what that means is we're putting, we're putting a zero on, switch colors, we're putting a zero on A here, and we're putting a zero on this NMOS, on this PMOS transistor. So if we put a zero on a PMOS transistor, is it on or off? On, okay, so this is on. Is What about this NMOS transistor? It's off. That, that will never be the same. It's like, remember my little thing from last semester, PQ never ever ever equals Q not? You're never going to have an instance where you're having it's the same input on a PMOS and an NMOS and they're going to be on or off. So, so we know this one's off. So that means no matter what, we're not going to go through this, right? So B and C, we don't have to really care about. So then we're going to check D. Right? So D is 1. So what does that mean? Is the NMOS on? Okay, E is 1, so that means it's on. So we automatically have a flow to the output. So we have our, we have correctly designed that circuit. So there's a whole field, and you're going to learn one thing, uh, one algorithm that you're going to use to, to check logic called the D algorithm later on in this course. Testing and fault tolerance, being able to test combinational and sequential circuits in CMOS, uh, being able to predict certain faults and what kind of the minimum number of inputs you have to put in in order to be able to correctly get an output. That's a whole field. You can create a whole course. I mean, there are whole courses created around that. But uh, obviously, if us think about it. So if you have a MIPS data path and it's 32 bits, right? Remember, 2 to 32 is an off incredibly huge number, right? So being able to check all 2 to 32 inputs, plus if you're doing arithmetic logic and you have another set of 2 to 32, so it becomes 2 to 64, it, you just don't have the time to do that. So even if you're running nine computers in parallel, that's going to take you years to get done. So being able to design cells that you know work at different levels makes life a lot easier for you. Uh, that's why understanding SSI, MSI, LSI, VLSI, because each of those different levels of abstraction requires a different design mentality. So that's a, that's a good thing to know going on for your rest of your career. So let me get past here and keep going on to the next problem. If it ever scrolls. Okay, so you guys correctly designed the circuit. Okay, so here uh, in 1.16, I'm kind of going over the, there are six fundamental masks used in CMOS, and you now understand what masks mean based on that video. So you're putting in masks, you're laying out the lithography, and the first thing you're going to have is your end well. Do you remember in the PMOS transistor, you have your heat and drain as P-type, and then you have a little end well in, inside of a P-bolt, P-type bolt. So that's the first thing you're going to worry about is N-well. Two uh, is polysilicon. So if you remember when I showed you the, we, remember you guys drew out the inverter, and the polysilicon had this on the A and B input? So the polysilicon, in this case, I, I mentioned that it's 20 uh, angstrom, but it's going to be very, very small. 
and you're going to be relating the size of the transistor when you see the 0.18 micron or 22 nanometer. It's going to relate to two thermic lambda to the size of this polysilicon. So that size will be your 22 nanometer. And lambda designs, which we're going to go over here in a minute, is half of that. So the polysilicon width will be defined as two lambda. Third, P N plus diffusion should make sense. P plus diffusion should make sense. Arsenic and boron put into silicon crystals. Contacts and metals. So these is kind of you're, you're doing your different layers, and then when you put all these together, that's when you're going to get an actual inverter. So you have your connections. You have your input connects to A and B. You have your wells. You have your metals. You have your BDD and ground and your output. And then your N plus diffusions. And then your P plus diffusion. You have your N well. And then all your different contacts. So you have contacts required for BDD. You have required contacts for gate, source, and drain. You have contacts required for your output. So then you see how these all gate, source, and drain, gate, source, and drain, BDD on there. So these all tie into the metals to be able to properly make a circuit. So if we go back up to our inverter, see this, okay, so here's our inverter. And so you have your metal, your polysilicon, you have your N plus diffusion, your P plus diffusion, your N well inside your P substrate. And then these contacts are gonna be used to actually ensure, and, okay, so basically the, the simplest way to describe a contact is being able to transfer a, a, this, the flow of electrons from one of these types to another. So if you have BDD metal going through a P substrate, you use a contact to be able to ensure the integrity of the signal. So that's 1.16 there. Okay, so that's 1.4, which we already did. 1.16. And so Feature size, the 1.17, this is very important. Feature size is the distance between the source and the drain. It is set by the minimum width of the polysilicon. So when I say that uh, the design, you'll be designing circuits in 0.18 micron. Okay? That means it's 100, and the width of this polysilicon here, from here to here, between the gate and the drain, is 180 times 10 to the 6 meters, which is a negative six meters of volume. So when you have 22 nanometers, that's 22 times, you know, 10 to the negative nine nanometers there. So the result is you need to know how long your channel is. So the smaller and smaller the channel is, the closer and closer these this P plus and N plus are, and then you're going to be worrying about different physical issues. So that's why uh, I made the grad video of the 22 nanometer is you have to get something called a thin fit, which is designed slightly differently from the gate source and drain. But at this level, I don't want to complicate things too much for undergrad. But so if you're it's not the length of the pin, it's the length of the gate. Yes, the specifically, yeah, the length. It's the width actually. The distance here. It's designed. It's a good question. So it's defined as the width from here to here. So to make the chips smaller, they want to shorten the channel between. Yes, exactly right. So I gave you guys an example here. You probably can't see it. I'd be able to let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. So I have the this is 0.13 microns. This is inside the transistor. And this right here, this little blip, which you're gonna see a lot better in the video, that's the relative size of the 22 nanometer. So that's Moore's law in action. So it has the same thing, gate source and drain. So you can you can actually tell the difference. This back here. And, and there's a good Moore's law of So here, in 1970, the typical feature size was six micrometers. 10, 6 times 7, 8 is 6. Then you get 1.5. You see how it's kind of flowing. Similar pattern. So I have a couple of these are working in 13 nanometer. Uh, I think IV, is it IBM that had their 7 nanometer? The third? Yeah, I mean, they made a, tra a transistor work. They're not getting computers to work. As you're going to learn in this course, 
is not just one or two transistors. You have to size them appropriately in order to ensure uh, low uh, sure logical effort uh, and being able to make uh, positive and negative uh, arrangements. So feature size of the views, 14 until 14 nanometer resolution. Why should you care? That 14 nanometers in the headline there is the distance between your gate and your drain and your transistor. So, okay, so you will be using what are known as lambda beast design names. So this is 1.18 uh, here. So lambda is equal to half of the feature size. So if I say the feature size is 22 nanometers, how big is your lambda? 11. Okay. So by definition, the polysilicon must, so rule number one, polysilicon must be two lambda. So if you're designing a circuit out, it's a good idea to go through and get a lot of design transistor and we'll be coming up with equations and methods to be able to calculate the precise number of lambda you need for your pull up and pull down networks and various designs. So rule two, metal and diffusion must have a minimum width and spacing of four lambda. That means four, there must be four lambda between any two metals in your circuit. Right, so you have two lambda, and then you have your gate and your drain, and they're separating your pull-up and pull-down networks. Anytime you have a contact, you have to make sure that these are sizes are separate and away from each other, right? So three contacts are two by two, two lambda by two lambda, and must be surrounded by one lambda on the layers above and below. So what you mean by electric, so now you understand about layers and you've got end diffusion. So if you make a contact, it has to, it has to be two lambda by two lambda by these lambda-based design rules that are very common. Um, you also have to have, any anytime you have a metal on a different layer going above or below it, it has to be separated by one lambda. And what we're gonna learn, I think it's section five wires. The wires, you act, we're gonna learn a lot about keeping distances between wires. Why do you think keeping distances between wires is important, especially in wire metal? Heat, what specific, what, what the heat dissipation causes what? You're on the right path. I'm sorry? Not, well, not quite. Not if, it, if, if, if the heat dissipation from a wire is already bad. Mess with the charge or what signal? Short, mess with the signal. All these are all the right ideas. So basically, if it's giving off enough heat and it's close enough to another wire, it can actually cause the electrons to flow, to flow. It'll create a thermal vibration. As a result, you can get the incorrect value in the circuit. So you're actually going to be learning how to calculate the distance you need from wires of certain widths and heights and widths and lengths. Yeah. So is that kind of like a, a transformer? No, a, a transformer is when, when you have two wires. Or, but what's the thing you did in electric circuits where you have two flows of electricity and they like jump to either side? You're talking about a capacitor? Yeah. But there, capacitance is an issue with these, with these wires. I because you, well, well, I mean, that's, I mean, the, the transformer is what, that's when you're trying to dissipate, a tr transfer volt voltage between one mm -hmm. wire coil and another because you, of the ratios. In, in, in electronics lab, we actually stuck a transistor in the oven and then watched the box. We shifted the temperature increase. Right. I think is that what you remember? No. That's kind of on the right idea. This has a little more to do with capacitance. You know how capacitance relates to the, the, the distance between the plates and the voltage. So you act as if you're if they're close enough, you'll actually create a voltage potential, which will create thermal vibrations in the lattice, which will end up causing a change in uh, having that. And being able to create that potential results from the heat, which is you're splitting too many electrons through a wire that you would properly design. Does that does that answer your question, Doug? Good. So polysilicon overlaps the fusion by two lambda where a transistor is desired and has a spacing of one lambda away when no transistor is desired. So let so you're going to have transistor space and then you're going to have wires that connect different cells. So you're you poly, when you're having a poly overlapping your fusion by two lambda, and I'm going to show you an example of the actual lay, converter layout uh, where you're going to see this difference. But if it's within two lambda, specifically where you want to design a transistor, 
but the overlap is only one lambda when you're just connecting to portions of the transistor. So polysilicon in contacts have a spacing of three lambda from other polysilicon and other contacts. And then the N well surrounds PMOS transistors by six lambda and avoids NMOS by six lambda. So if you recall from the inverter design, we have the spaces between NMOS and PMOS because we have to have this N well. So we're trying to avoid all of these different N well contacts from causing, I mean, so the N well from messing with the contact by providing this amount of spacing. And so I'm going uh, to just, uh, just describe this here in a second. But let me, uh, before I show you this diagram, there's one other very important definition for 1.19. The width length ratio is the ratio between the width of the transistor and its feature size. So you have the whole transistor and the width of the polysilicon. And that ratio becomes very important as you design larger and larger circuits. So that's something to keep in mind as you move on. So that's why I made a TGO. So, example 1.5, using the lambda-based design rules with a feature size of nan nanometers, what are the widths and lengths of the transistor? So, first thing we know, what is the size of, a, of, of lambda in a 90 nanometer feature size? 45 nanometers, you're correct. Lambda is equal to half of the feature size, therefore 45 nanometers. Rule, so again, I'm including more explanation than you need to include on homework. Rule one, by definition, the polysilicon must be two lambda. Metal and diffusion have a minimum width and spacing of four lambda. Therefore, the width is four times 45 nanometers, which becomes 180 nanometers. And the length becomes two lambda by rule, but therefore that becomes 90 nanometers. Therefore, your width length ratio is 4 lambda by 2 lambda, or 180 nanometers by 90 nanometers. So that's how you're actually going to be designing your circuit. So here, if we, if it ever lets me scroll, um, I can actually start to discuss what these, uh, how th these rules in action is supposed to. So here you have the black contact here. That's 2 lambda by 2 lambda. Remember, it's surrounded by one lambda above and below. So that blue metal, it's surrounded by one lambda that's a two by two contact. So you use that to be able to transfer those uh, signals from VED to your uh, fusion regions. So here we have two metals on each side of the polysilicon. So here the metal is going to be four lambda, and the spacing is also going to be four lambda. So you see right here. So you have your metal and diffusion regions are each four lambda, and the spaces between them have to be at least four lambda. So, so there's the metal contacts in there, sure. Polysilicon must be two lambda. The polysilicon and contacts must have a spacing of three lambda. So the polysilicon, when you have it going through, you're starting to connect inputs. This is going to be two lambda, and you have two inputs, like if you have a NAND gate. And you're trying to get signals, they have to be at least three lambda apart, or else we're going to start running into the issues that we just started talking about. So you can see this design here. And then, uh, as I alluded to, we'll be discussing uh, how you change PMOS and NMOS with length ratios, uh, how you figure those out. But for the time being, you're just going to deal with a two to one PMOS NMOS ratio. So we designed the NMOS one with 180. And 90 nanometers, so then you multiply that two because that becomes 360. So as a result, this is now our design of our inverter. So here we have our this is VED. This is ground. So you're going to have contacts there to supply from the VED to ground supply. And now I'm going to be showing you something. So here you have See how the, this is the pull-up network, this is the PMOS, it's twice the width of the NMOS transistor, right? So this is the this is the PMOS up here, and since the ratio is two to one, it's gonna be one time of the NMOS transistor, right? So this is your PMOS, and this is your NMOS, this is your polysilicon that brings in your input. So I'm sorry, the same thing here. PMOS is twice as much as NMOS, ground VDD. And so this diagram on the right, you can use this to correlate the rules that I showed you to actually figuring out how we actually 
designed it. So rule one, PA silicon must be two lambda. Rule two, you have to have uh, this, oh, sorry, where's rule two? Width is going to be rule two, so you have your width of your metal going to be uh, four lambda right here. So each of these metals here meets rule two. Rule three, your contact with the metal ceramics, so your contact is going to be two lambda by two lambda with a one lambda with a one lambda metal one surrounding it. So you can see that you have to have one. Okay, so one important thing I should show you here. You have your two contacts for your PMOS, right? So your two contacts inside there is you're making the width double. So you have a one lambda around each one. So if you look in here, you see it's there's going to be two lambda in between the two contacts because at that rule, we have the one lambda and one lambda becomes two lambda. So rule four, uh, being able to, you have to have one lambda extended beyond the polysilicon. So rule four, that applies here. You see the red circle I just drew is? That's where rule four applies. So rule five, polysilicon spacing from the contacts. Remember, you have to have two lambda from contacts to polysilicon in a transistor but only has to be one when you're not intending to have a transistor. So you see how there's a two lambda space in here between the polysilicon and the contact. So you have a two lambda spacing between the polysilicon and the contact here. Same thing, polysilicon and the contact, there's two lambda here. That's because of that design. And did I hit them all? And well, oh yeah, so you might, might not be able to see it, so let me put a circle around. So this is, your that red box, that's the actual bed well physically represented. It's six lambda around it. So that's the last rule. So that's how you just actually physically design the inverter. So it's a 940 Demba. So I don't know if you're in a rush to get, I know you, as I, I explained to everybody, it's Demba as a call class conflict. So so the last thing we're going to cover in today's lecture is this concept of stick diagrams. So as you can probably imagine, trying to design your PMOS and NMOS circuits, combining that uh, concept of being able to do your, you know, your pull up and pull down networks, and then translating it into these rules can be rather difficult. Fortunately, there are a lot of design automation rules that do a lot of this for you. Um, so the simplest way to do that is you lay out a stick diagram and then you apply your rules and then you complete the circuit. And so this is how you actually do cell design. And so the whole idea of a stick diagram is uh, to lay it out in a manner. Scroll down here. But it's not going to be not necessarily to scale, but then you apply your rules later. So this will cut down a lot of your time. And actually, there's a when I took a design automation course, we had a coding project where we actually designed in Java. It actually generated the stick diagrams for you. And then you had to come up with the way to do it. So I'm going to present the algorithm that I designed in that class to you guys. So here's an example of a stick diagram. So the blue in the stick diagram is your metal one. You have your N diffusion, so you have your P diffusion and your N diffusion. So your P diffusion represents your P, P MOS transistor. The green here represents the N MOS transistor, and the red represents the polysilicon, right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using these to be able to take the logic that we're doing from designing our circuits and being able to apply it to a stick diagram so you can come up with the logical layout for a circuit. So... We are going to do these, this thing called path diagrams. Path diagrams become very important. So the whole idea, as we've discussed multiple times already, uh, is that the path is just, so if you want a zero on the output, right? So you have a one on the input, and here we have our NMOS transistor. And so what's going to happen is you're going to create this channel here to allow Logic zero electrons to flow that way, right? So it's a path. So the whole idea now 
I want to see what logic we need to get in order to ensure that the path is created when we have the, the right logic. So we're going to do the idea for the uh, pull down network. We're going to do our path diagram. So step two is going to be draw the uh, path diagram for the pull up network. And I'll give you an example. We're going to go 1.6 is going to be the exact same problem as 1.5. It's going to be that not D or A and B or C. Um, draw the sticks for VDD, P active, V out, N active, and ground. And then draw contacts for the poly around for the N active pull up network, sorry, N active pull down network. And then last stage is draw the contacts for the poly for the P active pull up network. So, and that's 1.20. And I think that'll be where we end the TGO. So, example um, 1.6 is we're going to be drawing a stick diagram for F equals not D and D or A and B or C. So, it's the exact same equation. So, a good exam question. I give you a logic. First thing you do, you draw the pull up and pull down networks using the CMOS transistors. It's just like this, right? You put that as a circuit, you design that. And then the second part is draw the stick diagram. And that was an Intel interview question. So I promise there's a method to this math. All right, so the, for the pull down network, you want to have it going from ground to the output, right? So in this case, what we want is you're going to have ground here. And then we're going to use this logic. Now, we want a zero to come onto the output whenever. And so if D is one, right, that means we're automatically going to zero on the output, right? So if we go out, or in the, how I have it drawn here, it's V out. So first thing you do, one path is just D. Seems simple. So you draw the truth table and you try to figure out when do I want the zeros on the output and make those paths. So anytime it's D, it automatically goes. For those of you who are, if you remember K maps from 385 or, or 235, you can actually use those to actually design your uh, stick diagram simpler. Um, in this case, first thing you do can be B or C, right? Use the same rules as before. It's in parallel. So you can either do B, or C to get to this point here, right? But then it has to go through A. So then A is on the other. So if you look at this exact same value you design for B here, you first see they're in parallel because it's a work, and then you end it with A. So it's going to be the same. So you can just basically take this and try to that, right? So it's ground, path, tau, or D. Almost the same thing. So instead of actually just drawing it out like this, you have to think of it in terms of paths because then when you draw your stick diagrams, you're actually you can bring that to how it looks at the physical layer of the transistor. So same thing for PMOS, remember B or C are in series. So you start from V out, so I'm sorry, VDD. Sorry, I'm trying to keep this around so everybody can see. VDD, so it goes through B. Goes through C, right? Or it can go through, or rep through A, right, to get to this point, but then it has to go through D to get to B out. Right? Does that make sense? So now you're, now you're drawing this, these are your path diagrams. So then what you're going to do is you're actually going to take these path diagrams and convert that to the actual sticks. here. Okay, so remember that little stage um, that I had that before you actually draw the paths on there, I had this little uh, draw your inputs as polysilicon, so we have D, A, B, and C. And the reason I ordered it this way is because in both instances, you can, you, you want to try to minimize the flossing, the laminated possible. So in this case, I always seem to be starting in D or ending at D, right? So I put D as the first one in the case. I put C and B together because they're always in series or parallel depending on pull up or pull down network. Then they have to go through A and then they deal with D, right? So that's why I did it this way. And so since the exam is going to be take long, you can take a little bit of time to figure out how intuitive it is you want it to be and then go to that one.
So then what you want to do, D and D and ground is blue, and then D and L also be blue because you want it to be in that right where we're going to be cooking and murder. And then dryer T active and then active. I highly, I highly recommend you do a little key, like I had in the original diagram where you say, all right, this relates to this color. Um, in your in industry, you'll typically see red is polystyrene on, blue is metal one, and then orange is P active and green is inactive. That's just the conventional way. But as long as I understand what it is you're trying to tell me, it's fine. So then the last step is to actually take the paths and put them into your stick diagram. So here, how, here's how we've done the, uh, the pull down network and the, and the path. So this is our path that I did here, right? So see how it either goes from D to the output, or it has to go through. OK, so there's a one thing, there's one important concept here. So the transistors, the, the, the transistor for D is here, right? That's the transistor for D. And then, so this is the transistor for A, C, and B. So that's where the contacts come in. So what you want to do is, you, when you do your, your floor diagram, you want to go through the transistor. So it has to go from source to drain to count as going through a transistor, right? So in this case, if it goes through this path from ground to D to the output, like I've just drawn on the path diagram, Here's how it's physically working. It starts here at ground. It's going to go through this metal. This is the D transistor, so it's going from the gate to the drain in the D transistor, like I've drawn there, and then it flows here to the output. Does that, does that make sense what I've just done? So that's one of the parts. So the other portion of it is where it gets a little more complicated. So I want it to either go through the B or the C transistor, right? So what I've done is it starts here, and so B, this is the C transistor, and that's the B transistor, right? So what's gonna happen is it's gonna go this way to the C transistor, and around through metal, through the A transistor, and out. Like so, does that make sense what I just did? Let me explain that again. So here, the B, so here you're gonna go, B, A, and then out, right? Or it's going to go C, and it's going to circumvent the B transistor through this metal, A, and then out. And so that ties into B, A, and then out. Or if it's going to be C, you don't want it to go through the B transistor, right? So if it's going to be this case, since it's C, I'm oh, sorry, so this case it's B, B transistor. Install that would go from this contact on your drain of your B transistor to go to the source contact for the A transistor. And so it goes through here to your output. Does anybody have any questions about this? Let's find out. Usually, usually it's on a much bigger screen than the other Okay, so T transistor, right? So that is represented source and drain, and the poly represents the gate. So the gate is a one, so that activates the D transistor. I want the flow from ground to go through this transistor from the source to the drain, and then take the path from the contact through the metal to the out. So in this case over here, where you have B or C, you don't want it to be B and C, because B and C, you would start here at C, go through both of these, and then go to the output, right? In that, in that case, because of the end, it has to go, eventually has to get through the A transistor, because you see the A is here, this poly. So this poly represents the gate of the A transistor for the pull-down network. And so this is the drain, and that's the source. So somehow we need to develop a little network here the B or C transistor that ensures that whatever contact gets to the source from A either goes through B or C depending on the logic we want through the polysilicon. So in this case, what's happening, let's say that our C input is a 1, right? 
better example. Let me say the B. No, let's start with C. So C is a one, right? So it goes through here. C is a one. And this allows the flow, and then it just flows through A to B out, right? So let's talk about the instance where C is zero and B is one, because this is where this design becomes important. So if C is zero, that means it can't flow through there, right? But I still need to get to this contact. So what's going to happen is it's going to go here, and it's going to go through your B transistor. So the signal is here, right? I need to get it from there to there. So in this case, when I have a core like this, one of them is going to have this metal connector, though, so that the, the little box, may, it's not actually going through C there. Correct. Okay. That, that, that's the point, yeah. I didn't know if it was going through B and it was going through It's going through B okay. or C to get the case goes to A to the R. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody now? Right? Okay. So, so the PSD can be enacted. Well, right, it's like the possible channel. Correct. That's exactly. It's a great way of thinking about it. So you're going to take. You're going to eventually take a from ground to VDD through a metal contact through the P active if you eventually want a one on the output or an N active if you want zero on the output. Okay. So let's do the same thing with the pull up network. Now we're adding the pull up network to the full circuit. Right? So. I, in this case, it's always going to go through D, right? So BDD goes through D, and then it's going to take some sort of path, right? So in the same way, we have to use our metal design to be able to ensure that it gets through here. So in this case, it's always going to go through D. So the first thing that's going to happen, here's VDD here. It's going to go from the poly to the D transistor to here, always, in every instance. If D is off, then no matter what, it's going to be a zero. So in this case, I either need to go through B and C or A. Right. So you see how the metal is here between, this is the A transistor, and this is the C transistor, and this is the B transistor, right? So I'm either going to have the metal to go through around the C transistor and go through B and C, because if we go back to the path diagram, see how it's B and C? Does that make sense? It's going to follow the metal to do that. It's going to go through D, or if it's just going to go through A, it'll go through A to the output like so. Because when it follows the path, it's going to go through D, it's going to go through A to the output. So the whole goal of these path diagrams is to physically represent the path that either holes or electrons need to flow from VDD or ground to represent the logic that we want on the output. So being able to learn how to do this shows that you not only logically understand what's going on, but physically as well. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, uh, I'm happy to see what, what's next on this. Uh... Oh, oh mm -hmm. before I dismiss you. Thought question. And then I will give you guys example 1.7 for you guys to try and run. It's, it's just a little fun. Uh, it's a different uh, logic. Why? Let me see if I can zoom in on this figure here. There we go. Okay, so this is where we're going to end lecture, and then 1.7, you guys try on your own. Um, why is this stick diagram bad? There's a there's a fault in it. Regardless of what the logic is, this has an undeniable fault. So, can everybody see this? Everybody see this full circuit? So, tell me where the fault is in the logic. Tell me where the logic is in the high active. Where specific? The far right side. Yeah. This is what you're talking about? Why is that, why is that a fault? You, you've identified the fault, but just explain to me why it is. Yeah, because the whole idea of the path is it has to go that way. So any instance where you cannot control the flow is a fault.
You're gonna, I'll, I'll post the uh, video. I did test to make sure that it covers the whole screen this time. Um, and I want you all to try 1.7, which is, uh, let me see, let me zoom in. Uh, 1.7, design a CMOS transistor layout for F equals not the quantity A and B or D and C and E. Uh, it's already, it's a post on Blackboard and I'll, when I send out the video. And then draw its stick diagram. So you're going to go through the whole stage. So attempt this problem as though you are, oh, we got 10 minutes, so I'm going to dismiss you after this little spiel. Attempt this problem with the thought process of I am going, I, I, I'm being thrown this in a job interview, right? So you don't have access to anything. You've studied your notes, study the TGOs, attempt the other problems, and then presume you've got somebody sitting in front of you and saying, ask the, here's your question, and give it your honest shot. If you get it wrong, it's okay. Grade it, and then turn it in. So, because when you have it graded, then you'll know where your mistake was, so then when the exam comes, you won't make that mistake. So, as long as you show me your effort, I'll give you full credit. So, does anybody have any questions about stick diagrams? Um, if not, Y'all would be so kind as to help me put the tables back, and then I will try to make absolutely sure that this is the last time we're wearing this. Um, so, we don't have any TGOs. Oh, yeah, I'll, I will be the so TGOs that were covered in the video. I'll post the video and show over those because I'm supposed to do one time. Right. Thank you for bearing with me, my little experiment here. <laughs>